Hello everyone, my name is Omar and I am a postdoctoral fellow in sedimentary geology here at the University of Ottawa. And this work is a collaboration, a joint collaboration between the University of Ottawa and the Geologic uh, Survey of Canada. And before I begin, I'd just like to thank the, uh, the committee for organizing this conference, um, all the work that they put uh, forth in it, and uh, as well as my uh, to acknowledge my uh, co-authors on this work. So to set the stage, geologic context, this is a Laurentide ice sheet. At its maximum extent, it's about two to three kilometers thick in certain parts of Canada, that upon melting produces substantial volume of meltwater discharge. And this sediment-laden meltwater discharge was dispersed into the isostatically subsided Champlain Sea Basin, the maximum extent of which is shown, uh, of the Champlain Sea is shown in this map. And the city of Ottawa is the focus study area for today's talk. So the rationale for studying the Champlain Sea Basin is driven both by its great societal interests due to the, the potential susceptibility of these sediments to retrograde landsliding. As well, these sediments in the Ottawa and St. Lawrence River Valley serve as a regionally extensive aquitard, and so their integrity is also of great interest. This is a map in East Ottawa showing the distribution of these two boreholes. I know we've looked at two talks that have shown this, but for those of you who are just joining us now, um, BC2 and BC16, they're separated by a distance of about three kilometers in the municipality of Orleans in East Ottawa. And in fall 2019, uh, uh, scientists at the GSC, uh, in conjunction with other, uh, other groups, had continuously cored these two boreholes. And with these sediment cores, they were sent to Quebec City, where they were scanned using a medical grade computed tomography scanner, a CT scanner. And the CT scan data set allowed for the reconstruction of the depositional history of the stratigraphic succession. And so beginning at the base of the succession, there's a thin few meter thick interval of these mud rhythmites, parallel laminated, they look like classic varves, and this unit abruptly transitions into a few meter thick interval of bioturbated mud. Notice, you know, go from nicely stratified uh, rhythmites in the base to this bioturbated unit. And this bioturbated unit in turn abruptly transitions into this texturally diffuse, we call banded mud unit, that in turn abruptly transitions into this unit consisting of well-developed parallel stratification, as you can see uh, in the CT scan image here, that is in turn intercalated with these more diffusely stratified mud beds. And in the upper part of the succession, we do encounter uh, these beds of deformed mud that occur intercalated with the well-stratified and diffusely stratified mud beds. But the use of a CT scanner or you know, the CT scan data set, I mean, this provides sedimentological detail at about a 0 0.5 millimeter scale, being that of the CT scan resolution. It allows for the identification of bedding, of lamina, sedimentary structures, macroscopic uh, burrows, and, and presence of bioturbation. But what about sedimentological details at a sub 0 0.1 millimeter scale, that of sediment composition and texture and fabric? So in order to determine these details, we sampled the cores. And so bear in mind, these are uncompacted, un basically unconsolidated mud from which we were able to produce uh, polished thin sections. And these polished thin sections were examined using an optical petrographic microscope. And the polished samples were then coded for SEM analysis. And this microtextural data that was collected through the summer and the early fall, it open the avenue for a number of research questions that could be addressed. First of which, which I'll address is, what is the texture, the fabric, and the origin of biogenic structures in Champlain Sea Mud? And so a number of different burrow fills were recognized based on the texture and fabric of the sediment. The first of which is a burrow fill consisting of a clay-rich fill, as you can see here marked by a silt-rich lining, as you can see here. And so these burrows are several hundreds of micrometers in their diameter. They're often elliptical to subcircular in cross-section. This photomicrograph shows an assemblage 
of these clay-rich uh, filled burrows that are lined by silt. Take it one scale further down to the SCM scale. This shows the fabric of these uh, burrow fills. Note the elliptical uh, morphology. Uh, the detail on the right shows the clay-rich fill. It consists mostly of clay-sized sediment. There's some dispersed, very fine to fine silt as well within the fill. And then it's sharply lined with a silt-rich lining, consisting mostly of uh, silt-sized sediment. The other type of burrow fill that was recognized is that of a silt-rich fill that has a distinctive clay-rich lining. These burrows are typically on the order of about 150 to 300 micrometers in their uh, diameter, also elliptical to subcircular in cross-section, and they're easily differentiated from the mud matrix. So here you can see the silt-rich uh, fill, which, uh, which uh, makes up the core of the burrow, surrounded by its clay-rich lining. And here you can recognize in this photomicrograph, you can identify the presence of several of these burrow fills, uh, notice the distinctive biofringence of the clay-rich lining and, and the silt fill, which is, is quite recognizable and, and can be distinguished excuse me, from the mud matrix. We take it one scale further down to the SEM scale. So note the, the texture and fabric of these silt-rich fills consists mostly of silt-sized sediment surrounded by a few tens of micrometer thick clay-rich lining. Right, that can be quite variable depending on, on how the, the burrow has been intersected in terms of whether it's an oblique cut or... And the third type of burrow fill that was recognized is a clay-rich fill that has a clay-rich lining. Now, difficult to, to uh, determine the fabric at the, uh, at the optical microscope scale, but the fill is structureless. It's clay-rich. The lining consists mostly of clay to fine silt. This photomicrograph shows a dense assemblage of this type of burrow fill. At the SCM scale, here you can see the structureless nature of the clay-rich fill, and so the fills are only a few tens of micrometers in diameter, marked by uh, a clay to very fine to fine silt-sized lining of which the particles are aligned parallel to the burrow boundary, as you can see here. And the burrow boundary is in turn marked by medium to coarse silt size sediment. And so what was recognized were three burrow types in the succession. But also important to note is that along bedding parallel sections is the architecture of these burrows, which consists of these sinuous forms, as you can see here. So these are CT scan images. And so the different types of burrow fills uh, their size, which is a few tens to a few uh, several hundreds of micrometers in, in, the, in their scale, as well as their architecture. Well, these resemble those produced by modern marine myofauna. Myofauna simply referring to small organisms between the range of 0 0.045 uh, micrometers to 1,000 uh, micrometers. The structure of the clay-rich burrow fills, well, this type resembles those generated uh, by deposit feeding in faunal organisms, whereas the distinctive, well-developed clay-rich lining, well, this fill and the passive fill, that of the silt-rich fill, well, this resembles those of organisms that generate dwelling and or feeding structures. The second research question I want to address was, what is the occurrence and origin of iron sulfide minerals? And what is the association of these minerals with biogenic structures? And so iron sulfide takes the form of pyrite, mostly of pyrite in the succession. And the pyrite occurs in a crystalline form in a number of different uh, occurrences. The first of which, and this is the most commonly uh, occurring form of pyrite, is that in the form of these elongated clusters of framboids. So uh, both of these SEM micrographs, electron micrographs, uh, show these elongated uh, uh, voids that have been infilled with framboidal pyrite. And so the, framboidal, uh, the pyrite framboids are typically on the order of about 5 to 15 micrometers. The other form of pyrite that was recognized are these irregularly shaped concretionary masses as you can see here. And so the pyrite is kind of poorly developed 
has a poor crystalline habit kind of clustered together. And these are typically on the order of about 60 to 100 micrometers. And lastly, pyrite also occurs as euhedral crystals that fill the interstitial pore space in biotite crystals. So these, uh, both of these electromicrographs show pyrite in a euhedral form that has precipitated along the, uh, within the interstitial pore, sp uh, pore space uh, between these expanded uh, mica flakes. And so the, the extensiveness of the pyrite cement can range from locally developed as uh, shown in the example on the left to extensive as shown in the example on the right, almost completely infilling the space uh, between the uh, cleavage planes. And so the first form of pyrite, that of these framboid fill structures, will these structures morphologically resemble those produced by a burrowing myofauna? Pyrite framboids, these form in sediments uh, when uh, pore water sulfide from organic matter decomposition reacts with dissolved uh, ferrous iron. And the source of the organic matter is thought to have been directly from myofaunal activity, that of mucus trails and uh, mucus secretions left behind by the burrowing, uh, burrowing in faunal organisms. In other words, animals burrow through the sediment, they secrete mucus, organic slime to ease their passage, and then decomposition of the mucus trails left behind by the infaunal organisms can provide a food source for sulfate reducing bacteria, which leads to localized pyrite precipitation. The other form of pyrite that occurs is poorly crystalline, kind of irregularly shaped concretionary form. Well, this is interpreted to have uh, pre uh, precipitated in pore spaces that were not significantly enriched in reactive organic matter which resulted in the precipitation of these indiscreet, kind of poorly defined uh, crystals. Lastly, the euhedral pyrite, which occurs between the mica flakes. This is interpreted as localized sequestration of iron into pyrite, where the iron is sourced directly from the alteration of the micrograins, a truly in situ, orthogenic, uh, in place process. What I also identified uh, through this microtextural study was the presence of orthogenic marcasite. Marcasite is a dimorph uh, of pyrite, so it has the same chemical composition but a different crystal structure. And the marcasite occurs as both well, the replacement and overgrowth of framboidal pyrite within elongated cavities within the sediment. So note the scale. These are on the order of a few hundreds of micrometers, uh, very similar to the to the uh, uh, clustered forms of framboidal pyrite that fills uh, cavities that we saw uh, a few slides prior. The example on the right, uh, this indicates the presence of pyrite framboids, which you could see at the core of this overall concretionary growth. And the pyrite framboids have then been overgrown by marcasite. And marcasite is characterized by this blocky kind of tabular morphology. Here are two other examples. Well, one example, one is a, a magnified view on the right. Uh, but what this shows, uh, take your attention to the left, is a pyrite framboid that has been replaced, as you can see here, and overgrown by marcasite, the detail of which is shown on the right. So here's the original um, pyrite framboid. Then you can see the you know, there's been some partial replacement and overgrowth of the marcasite, which is this kind of tabular, uh, blocky, uh, crystalline iron sulfide mineral. So the origin of marcasite in the sediments. Well, marcasite necessitates acidic conditions. Okay, it requires low pH conditions to form. And it's thought that there was an influx, well, the interpretation is an influx of oxygen bearing fluids that reduced poor water pH. This may have potentially been facilitated by the abundance of tunnels, uh, this network of burrows that was being produced um, by infaunal, myofaunal organisms. This combined with most probably a consistent influx of oxygen rich glaciogenic meltwater that was being dis discharged and dispersed into the basin during the annual melting season. 
And both of these serve to most probably enhance pore water infection and the diffusion of dissolved oxygen and direct to the downward migration of oxidation fronts. And so the principal mechanism by which we may have a reduced pore water pH is the oxidation of previously formed sedimentary pyrite. And so this mechanism provides the means of producing both uh, dissolved iron and producing the low pH conditions that are necessary and needed for marcosite formation. And the third research question I'd like to address is, what were the paleoenvironmental controls on, a burrowing, uh, on burrowing in faunal organisms in the succession? So take your attention back to the simplified cross-section between both of the boreholes showing the five lithostratigraphic mud-rich units. The basal part of the succession, that of unit one, these mud rhythmites, classic varves, well, these were interpreted to have been deposited in a glacial lacustrine freshwater setting. Whereas the overlying strata, that of the bioturbated mud and the banded mud, well, these were deposited in a saltwater basin, that of a glacial marine setting. And the first appearance of burrows occurs within the bioturbated mud. And it's spectacular in the succession, you can actually put your finger you know, the abrupt transition between, uh, you know, glacial lacustrine strata and overlying glacial marine strata. But two of the burrow, uh, burrow types uh, occur mostly in the lowermost part of the succession, as indicated on the slide here. And the third burrow type, that of the clay rich fill with the clay rich lining, occurs exclusively in deformed mud beds near the top of the succession. And so I'll begin with the, uh, the uh, burrow type shown at the top of the succession that occurs within the deformed mud. And so its exclusive occurrence in that of deformed mud is most probably a consequence of this mud being sourced uh, by a slope failure on the margin of, of a deltaic margin. Now, these bur this type of burrow fill is not found anywhere else in the succession. It's exclusive only to, to the deformed mud and the intercalated strata, that of the well stratified mud and diffusely stratified mud. In other words, the kind of beigeish, slightly yellowish strata um, that occurs throughout do not contain any of these burrow fills. Now, one of the major controls on the presence of biogenic features uh, maybe been that of the nature or the chemistry of the basin fluid, that of a change from a freshwater to a saltwater basin fluid. So the incursion of uh, the Champlain Sea um, provided what is a hospitable environment for, the, uh, for these benthic uh, myofaunal um, organisms. I should note that pyrite is found exclusively um, in the samples of which burls were identified. And so if I take your attention to where we see the uh, lowermost two burrow types and their exclusive occurrence in the lowermost part of the succession and why the presence of burls are not found above this interval. Well, if I take you to the next slide, this shows this series of plots shows bed thicknesses in the succession. And so from the base to the top, of the succession, bed thicknesses increase markedly. But this is the interesting point is that within each unit, bed thicknesses are consistent. Bed thicknesses are mostly consistent around an average mean uh, bed thickness. They're you know, roughly about two centimeters thick in, in the basal unit. They're, they double to triple in their thickness in unit two. They likewise double to triple in thickness in unit three. And again, they, uh, uh, often double in thickness in unit four time. It seems that the increase in sedimentation rate, in particular that of which is observed in unit three, um, likely serve the principal control on either the, uh, uh, the ability of these benthic burrowers to, um, to thrive um, at and beneath the seafloor and the loss of any um, bi uh, biologic activity. And just to conclude, uh, we just have about. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say yeah. we have one minute left. Minute left. Okay, perfect. So, uh, future work. Uh, the plans for the remainder of this year 
are to work on this study, which is a comparison of the microtextual characteristics of hyperpycnal flow and hypopycnal plumes, both of which are types of uh, density currents, one of which is a bottom hugging density current, one of which is um, a positively buoyant uh, plume. And the purpose of the study is to provide a direct comparison of the deposits of these two types of flow types from the thin section to the optical microscope to the SEM scales and to potentially address the question, does the texture and structure of these different deposit types influence the geotechnical and reservoir properties of the sediment? And I thank you all very much for your time. Thank you.